right, tonight I want to focus in there, 1 Timothy chapter number 4, and we'll begin reading in verse number 8, actually. Let's begin in verse number 8. The Bible says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Verse 9, this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. Now, really, I want to focus on verse number 10. Draw your attention there. It says this, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Tonight I'm going to be preaching uh, what may be considered a very simple sermon. Uh, it's, of course, a doctrine. All, everything that is taught from the Bible you know, is doctrine, but it's a virtue as a Christian that you need to have in your everyday life. And this is a virtue that is cast to the wayside by many people. It is probably one of the most difficult things in the Christian life that we, as Christians, are asked by God to do. And that is suffering approach. Or reproach, I'm sorry. Suffering reproach. You know, allowing someone. What is a reproach? Let's begin with that. A reproach would be some sort of criticism. A reproach could also be something physical, some sort of, uh, of injury or harm that has been done to you. Now, at the end of the sermon, I'm kind of going to go over things that are not necessarily exceptions, but things that would not fall into this specific category. Maybe people would have questions. Well, what about this? Is this what you're talking about tonight? So I'll go over all that at the end, but you'll see a common thread through all those that do suffer reproach in the Bible. It's all the, the same types of scenarios. And as I mentioned... This is a virtue of the Christian faith that many people don't practice. This is a virtue of the Christian faith that the majority of Christians you know, uh, don't, put in, don't engage in their lives very often. And the reason being because it's very difficult to suffer reproach. It's very difficult just to allow someone to say something about you, allow someone to defame you, and not to say anything back, not to answer for yourself. But isn't that what the Bible is asking of us? And we'll see that over and over again and preach about suffering reproach. Now, I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. We'll see this taught from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Matthew chapter number 5. This is the Beatitudes. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And in particular, the Sermon on the Mount stretches all the way, I believe, to uh, chapter number 8, I believe. And uh, actually 7, it ends in uh, it's Matthew 5 through 7, but Matthew chapter number 5 is specifically, this portion of the sermon is called the Beatitudes. We see here in Matthew chapter 5, I want you to look at verse number 38. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 38, it says this, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, verse 39, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, it says this, turn to him the other also. Keep reading, verse number 40. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. And he summarizes it this way. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Now, I preached a sermon uh, when I was back in uh, Kentucky on the subject of you know, going the extra mile, going, going a little further. I don't even remember the title of that sermon. Brother really, Elliot, you were there. You remember the title of that sermon? I, I can't even remember the title of the sermon. But I preached about how in the Christian life, we are asked to do more. We're asked... To go, oh, that's the title of the sermon, Above and Beyond. There you go. We're asked to go above and beyond. And that's actually exactly what's being taught right here. All throughout Matthew chapter number 5, what you have Jesus basically telling them is, hey, this is what the law says, but I expect more of you. This is what the law says, but what I would actually want you to do is I want you to really do this. You know, the law says this. But this is, and they're not contradicting. He's saying, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm hiring the bar. I'm raising the bar. I'm raising the standard. Like he says here, if a person, this is actually where we get the, 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 the expression, he goes the extra mile. Right? You've heard that expression? What are, what are you saying? 
You're saying that person goes above and beyond, right? If you were to say that about an employee, right, uh, an employer were to say that about one of its employees, they'd be saying he goes the extra mile, saying he does more than what's asked for him, right? Well, that actually comes from verse number 41. And whosoever shall compel thee, thee to go a mile, go with him plain. That's where that phrase comes from, go the extra mile. And really in Christianity, when we're asked to suffer reproach, that is going the extra mile. That is, you know, uh, you know doing even more for Jesus. It's doing that which is what no, what no religious group, what no group of any sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, devout followers would do. Buddhism, all of these types of groups. This is a very, this is a, one of the most difficult virtues in the Christian life. And there are basically two camps that come out of this. There, are, there is the, the, the camp, which is a portion actually of what people refer to as Anabaptists, where they have just a, 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 just a non-resistance, just a, a pacifist type of attitude, where they are just, they believe that there is never a time in which you should even defend yourself. Now that's not what, this is not talking about self-defense and defending your home, defending, this is just talking about personal reproach. Is this person being attacked to be killed? No, he's talking about a person just smacking you in the face, right? And he's saying, if a person does that to you and personally offends you in that way, turn your other cheek to them also. He's not saying he's trying to kill you, right? And then he goes on further, you know, telling you to go the extra mile. He gives you a couple of other examples. People often turn to this, as I said, and, and, and try to uh, uh, bolster or try to support the teaching that you should never defend yourself. And that's not what this is talking about. What, what I'm preaching about tonight is I'm preaching about personal reproaches. I'm talking about people personally attacking your character, personally attacking you, know, you, how you live your life. Now, I'll go ahead and cover this as well, too. The times in which you should stand up, let, and, and, and let, I'll even refer to it as this way, for yourself, is when you are actually standing up for the Bible. Now, if you are standing up and you are preaching doctrine, you are preaching, you know, a, a truth about, you know, the Godhead, for example, right? And someone is attacking what you're preaching, well, you're not really standing up for yourself, actually, are you? That's why I said I'll use that phrase, but it's not necessarily correct. Who you're standing up for is God. Who you're standing up for is the Bible. What you're standing up for is the doctrines of the Bible. You know, but as far as people attacking us personally, as far as people attacking our character, what we should do as Christians is we should just suffer reproach, shouldn't we? I mean, here's the thing. When things become difficult uh, you know, to put into practice, oftentimes you need to ask yourself this question. If it doesn't apply at this time in my life, when does it apply? And what that does is that causes you to kind of understand that you're not wanting to apply this at all in your life. So then that, that, that can get you in the state of mind to take a step back, to reanalyze your life and understand, you know, I actually should be implementing this in my life in many areas. And when I say that this is a difficult thing to do, I don't think Jesus is figuratively saying somebody smacks you in the face. I think that Jesus is saying if someone personally offends you, and a perfect example of this is maybe you're out soul winning and someone smacks you in the face. I'm not going to lie, this would be extremely difficult. Do you know what Jesus asks of you? Turn to him your other also, your other cheek also. That's what you should do as a Christian. That's difficult. That may not be where your mind was or what you planned on doing five minutes ago. But you, we should always be continually, you know, uh, reforming our mind to the Word of God. Amen. And in areas of life that are difficult, that's hard, I don't care if it's preached or practiced, this is what the Bible teaches, my friend. So if Jesus is asking you to suffer personal reproach all the way to the point that if a person smote you in the face. Now, if, if someone is, is, is beating you to where they're, you know... They're relentlessly about to kill you. You better defend yourself, right? In the Bible, the Bible, just quickly, I didn't plan this in the sermon, but the Bible teaches self-defense, okay? Jesus, when he's leaving, so Jesus miraculously protected and provided for his disciples. But when he was leaving, he was about to be arrested. He told his disciples that he was going to be leaving, and he said specifically to them that they need, if 
They needed to have a sword, and if they didn't have a sword, sell what they have, sell their possessions so that they could have one. And people will say, well, they didn't really need a literal sword. They, he looks at them, the disciples look at Jesus and says, here's two. And he says, it is enough. He's speaking of real, literal swords. Why? Because they need to protect themselves because Jesus beforehand was miraculously or supernaturally protecting them while they were going around, right? In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about if a person breaks into your house at nighttime and the sun is not risen yet, even if they're there to steal something and you kill them, you're not held liable for that. Because the reason why it says even if they're there to steal, steal someone, you shouldn't kill somebody that's like... If somebody's like breaking into your car, you shouldn't like pull out your nine and go out there and shoot them, right? Is, is, is stealing something worthy of the death penalty? No. No, of course not, right? It's not worthy of that punishment. So that's not right what you're doing. But if someone breaks into your house at nighttime, you're not necessarily sure why they're there, right? I'm going to do what I need to do to protect my family. Right. So, you know, in that case, I would pull out my nine, right? Right. right. You have one, by the way. All those people watching, I was talking over here for a minute. The queers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but here's the, <laughs> but here's the thing. Like if I'm just walking down the street, if I'm walking down the street, and let's say that I'm trying, I try to give the gospel to somebody, right? And a person approaches me, and or I approach the person and I hand them an invitation, and they are just not interested. I'm like, hey man, you know the Bible teaches that if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to die and you're going to burn in hell one day. And that guy just lays one across my face. I want to give you a real example. Do you know what Jesus says that you should do? You should turn the other cheek. Now, like I said, what you need to do is you need to back up in your mind. Before I started preaching, before you started reading this passage and think, what would you have done before you just freshly heard the word of God? It's difficult, man. It's very difficult. But this is what you need to be doing. We're not playing church. Amen. You need to be really conforming. That, you know, the tough guy is the guy that's willing to, to take the mark across the face right. and turn the, cheek, the other cheek to him. That's good. That's the tough guy. Amen. Yeah. The tough guy is the one that's able to, he's able to uh, present discipline. He's able to show discipline and engage discipline in his life. That's the person that's tough. Right. It doesn't make you tough because you beat this guy up, right? That's not, you know, who, who is really the tough guy. Right. The tough guy is the one who's able to take the hit, who's able to take the punch, and then turn the other cheek to him also. And then turn around and say, hey, you know what? What I said was still true. You're going to die and burn in hell if you don't believe in Jesus. Yeah. Turn around and walk away. That's what you should do. Run real scenarios through your mind. You know what? When you're in a situation where, and this is, these are things you have to be prepared for. Maybe this could happen at work. You have no idea, right? Run these, you know, and run these scenarios through, certain scenarios through your mind and think, what would I have done? You know what you need to do? You need to fix that in your life. You need to fix these areas of your life. Go to, I'm going to have you turn now to 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 19. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 19. Now, there are different ways that we can be reproached. It can be a, you know, a physical uh, striking, if you will, or hitting, but it can also be you know, verbal. And if it's something that's personally directed at you, if it's something that's just a personal attack on you, what we should do is we should just ignore it. 1 Peter chapter number 2, I want you to look at verse number 19. 1 Peter chapter number 2, look at verse number 19. It says this. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Saying he's suffering when he actually didn't do anything wrong. Verse 20. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted, saying when you're hit, when, if, if when ye be buffeted for your faults, Ye shall take it patiently. So he's teaching, the Bible's teaching right here, What? how is that anything great if you do something wrong, like let's say that you steal something and your you know, society's punishment is lashes, right? And you, you took it patiently, like I'm going to endure through this. What glory is it? Did, you know, what's the good of that? You deserve that in the first place. That's his point. Then it says this, But if when ye do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, 
This is acceptable with God. Now, this is obviously in the context of being punished by, let's say, government. Look at verse number 21. The apostles, of course, being a prime example of being punished by their own government, by you know the Jews taking them and throwing them in prison, uh, giving them lashes. Paul, you know, this happened to him numerous times. Verse 21 says this. For even hereunto were ye called. Let that sink in. This is what you were called to do. When you, when you got saved, God had plans for you, and this was a part of it. But Joel Osteen ain't preaching that. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, saying, he never sinned. So if he would have ever been punished, it would have been being punished wrongfully. He wouldn't have deserved it. Verse 23, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. So when someone spoke bad at him, of course in the situation, this is personally speaking, when he was being beaten before he was nailed to the cross, before he was condemned to death, he was reviled, and he reviled not again. When he, when he suffered, saying this is actually suffered being used in a different way, saying being tormented, right? When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Notice that. Committed himself to him that judges righteously. Now I'm going to read to you where we began, 1 Timothy chapter number 4, and you'll see that this is what we're supposed to do in a situation like this, is what we should do is we should trust in God that everything will end up right. See, that's a hard thing for the world to do. That's a hard thing for someone that has no faith and they have no God or no higher power or creator even that they believe in at all, is to say that, hey, I'm depending on the Lord to get me out of this. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 4. I'm sorry, don't look there. I'm going to read to you. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 10, where we began, it says this. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Now listen, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. So notice, why do we do this? Why are we willing to suffer reproach? Because we trust in the living God. Because we know that he will repay us. That's what it says there in 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 23, of the reason why Christ did this himself. It says, he committed himself to him that judges righteously. So when you're in these types of situations and you were to be smote in the face or you were to be reviled or be reproached in some way or another personally, what you should do is just suffer it. What you should do is just allow it. What you should do is just put up with it. And you know why? Because you should just trust God, when he tells you to do it, and that he will reward you, and that he will repay you. I want you to go to uh, Luke chapter number 23, verse number 34. We'll see a prime example, a perfect example of the Lord Jesus Christ actually putting this into practice. While even hanging on the cross and moments from death, he says in Luke 23, 34, the famous words, Then said Jesus, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lot. I mean, that's an amazing thought. A lot of this, the, the parts of the Bible, the stories of the Bible, we can become numb to. But he's hanging on the cross and about to die. The very people that nailed him to that cross and put them, the reason why he's pouring blood, he prays to God in heaven about those people. They're all standing around him and they just beat him and, and, and you know, he's bloody and bruised and and he's, you know, he's about to die from the wounds that these, that these men had given him. And he says to God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I mean, that's a powerful example we have there. Look at Luke 7, verse 51. Luke chapter number 7, verse number 51. If you say, oh, well, that's only because he's God. You know, I couldn't do that. But there's other great examples in the Bible that we should look to as well of just mere men, just disciples and apostles, and Stephen was a great example. This is a very similar story, and you know why he did this? Is because he was doing just that. He was being a Christian. He was following Christ. He was living the way that Christ lived his life. And he had Jesus as an example just prior to this. Look at Luke chapter number 7, verse number 51. He says, He stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your father did. So do ye. So does he sound like he's scared or he's a sissy? No, not at all. I mean, he's, he's preaching hard at them, isn't he? Verse number 
Verse 52, which of, the, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain from which, slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye, ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, because it was true, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now notice what the Holy Spirit, uh, right here in verse number 60, has for us. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. These are the last words of this man before he dies. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's powerful. Yeah. That's not... That's not somebody who's a sissy. That's not somebody who's a coward. He's standing there and he's preaching hard and he's not going to give in. He just keeps preaching to the point where they end up taking him and they cast him out of the city and they're stoning him with stones. And while he's dying, the very last moment, he doesn't curse them, revile them. He doesn't try to defend himself personally. What does he do? He prays to God and says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That's an amazing example. Just a man. Go to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says in Romans 12, 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So we shouldn't be you know, physically going out and trying to seek our own vengeance, should we? It says in verse 20, therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. Now verse 21 is really interesting. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Notice that first statement. Be not overcome of evil. Because that's really what would end up happening. Is they, they, what they do is a person that, you know, the people that were attacking Stephen, all of those even that were going after Jesus, people that may attack our church and everything, what will end up happening to you if you get sucked into this where you feel like you constantly have to respond, you constantly have to retaliate, you constantly have to defend yourself, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up being overcome of evil. And you'll just be walking around with just a heart full of evil and bad things where you're just harmed, where you're just constantly wanting to injure other people. Because you just get into this mindset where you just everybody's against you, you know, everybody's you know saying something bad about you, you get in this defensive mode and you're just overcome with evil. Just this this attitude where you always have to just go after other people as well. Turn to first Peter chapter number three. First Peter chapter number three. First Peter chapter number three, chapter number three also about being rewarded being rewarded for suffering suffering reproach. 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 9. You'll see this again. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called. Now, does that sound familiar? We're going to talk about how this is what we were called into. We're reading in 2 Peter chapter number 2. It says it again here, there are two called. Now watch why you're called to this. That ye should inherit a blessing. So God called you unto this. He saved you and he called you and set you apart to do this work and, and to live this life, right? And just by nature of following Christ, you are going to be hated. And you will eventually be personally attacked. You know what you should do? You should just suffer it. And God called you unto this so that... You would suffer it. That's what he wants you to do so that he can give you a blessing. Think about that. I want you to turn now one more. Let's look at an a Old Testament example. Uh, go in the Old Testament to 2 Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 5. It's a great example. 
2 uh, Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 5. <clears throat> We're going to end the Old Testament. We'll look at one other scripture after this. I'll read you these other couple of scriptures. We'll end the sermon a little bit shorter tonight, a little bit earlier tonight. It'll be a shorter sermon. 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read you from 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Verse number one, this is about suffering yourself to be defrauded by brethren. It says this, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are, you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life... Set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law with one another. And he says, why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather... Suffer yourselves to be defrauded. Verse 8. Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. And then I'm going to read you also from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. We read this a few weeks ago, but the Apostle Paul talks about how he also suffered persecution, and he allowed persecution. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 11 says, Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted. And have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. Let that sink in. There in 2 Samuel chapter number 16, we have the great example of this, of David. David was a great example, a great man in the Old Testament. He's a man that had a lot of self-control. He's a man who had a lot of discipline. You read, you read about the life of, of uh, David. 2 Samuel chapter number 16. Chapter number 16, let me get there myself. 2 Samuel chapter number 16. This is when David uh, lost the kingdom to Absalom and he's fleeing away. It says in 2, King, uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 5. Let's look at verse number 5. And when King David came to Behurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still. As he came. So he, while he's walking, he's cursing. While he's walking is what that means. Still as he came. Verse 6. And he came forth. I'm sorry. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. So he's literally picking up rocks or stones. And he's throwing these rocks and he's throwing these stones at King David and all the men that are with him. And it says and he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Now notice what we refer to these men as. These are mighty men. Verse 7, And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man of Belial. Saying he's of the devil. He's a man of the devil is what he's saying. Verse 8, The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. So he's saying that this is basically David's punishment from God, because he spilled so much blood, and King Saul you know, spilled so much blood, now David is being punished for all of this, because he's a bloody man. Verse number 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And this guy is quick to anger. He's definitely not going to be a pastor one day. <laughs> Verse 10. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? Verse 11. And David, and David said to Abishai, And to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? He's saying, how much worse can this guy do to me when my son and my love that came forth out of my own bowels is trying to kill me? Why do I care that this guy, Shimei, right, of, you know, of Gera, you know, of the son of Gera, why would I care about this guy? What, how much worse can it get? 
And then he says in, uh, right after it says this, let him alone and let him curse. He says, for the Lord has bidden him. The Lord bid him to get allowed him to do anything, saying, because God could just strike him dead at any moment, right? Verse 12, it may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction. Watch this. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. Isn't that what we read multiple times? That thereunto ye are called that ye might what? Inherit a blessing. What does it say in Romans chapter number 12? Be not overcome you know, uh, with evil, but overcome evil with good. And then it talked right before that about, it talked about how that you would uh, be rewarded for this. If you were able to overcome evil with good. David understood this very same teaching. This not only happens here, but this happens with him and Saul as well. As a perfect example of that also. Where Saul's the king, Saul's the anointed one. And I'm pretty sure... Maybe it's just that we're reading this right now. Maybe somebody else remembers. Was it Abishai that was with him as well when he sent the he sent one of his uh he's one of his, his cousins or his nephews. He sends one of his nephews over and he tells him to go, you know, uh, uh, to go over there with Saul when Saul's sleeping and Joab's there, right? And or it's Abner. And Abner and Saul are over there, and he tells him to go over there, and he's like, let me smite him, and I'll smite him to the ground once. I won't do it more than that. I'm pretty sure that's Abishai there too. Guys, quick to anger. But you know, what did David say? Yeah, that's pretty, yeah, it's crazy when you really think about it in real life, isn't it? David's like, no, we, we're not going to lay our hand upon the Lord's anointed. This is while Saul is camping outside for the purpose of killing David. You know why Saul was in that camp? Why he went back home? Because he was seeking to kill David. David receives the opportunity that somebody might even, even have, have interpreted that God brought him in here for you to kill him, right? He's, he goes into a cave to sleep. He goes into a cave to sleep, yeah. and he's napping. <laughs> and David sneaks up and cuts off, you know, the skirt of his garment, right? And then he takes that and he flees away. David didn't lay a hand on him physically. And even from doing that, it says afterwards that David's heart smote him. He, what's going on? Saul's trying to persecute and kill David. That's why Saul was out there for that purpose then too. He was out there to find David to kill him. David sneaks up behind him and all he does is cut off the skirt of his garment because he was going to take that and say, hey, I could have killed you. But even just from doing that, while Saul's seeking to do evil to David, even just David, while, he wants, while Saul wants to kill him, let that in your mind, David cuts off his garment and David felt bad. Think about that. That's, that's a lot of discipline. That's, that is a strong man. Right. It has nothing to do with physical strength. That's not what's important. Right. You know, there are areas where physical strength is important, but when we're speaking spiritually, by far the most important thing is being able to control your spirit. Amen. Being able to control, you know, your, your, your really what you're, what you're doing is you're controlling the direction of your life. Because you can make a decision that can alter your life in seconds. Even just something simple in a fight if someone did, you know, if they smote you and you hit them back and you hurt someone severely, you could be sued, you could go to jail, you could, you know, it could alter your life in a terrible way. You have no idea what, what could end up happening. And why, you know, what, what type of attitude should we have? Well, David is a perfect example for us. Makes, you know, good sense why the Bible says that he's a man after God's own heart. And then we see God as a man, and he does a lot of the same things that what? That David does. He does a lot of the same things where he's reviled and he doesn't revile back, like Shimei. He's cursed and he blesses, doesn't he? He's hated and he just shows love to people and helps them. Right? Even when we see the Lord's anointed is trying to kill him, just cutting off the, the hem of his garment, it, it smokes his heart. So we can see that this wasn't him just playing church, kind of like I mentioned in the beginning. This was how he truly felt on the inside. And what's the reason? Because he wanted to do that which is right in the, in the eyes of God, in the sight of God. And that's what we should be focusing on the inner man. I've been trying to preach sermons in the past few Sunday evenings on strengthening the inner man. On strengthening who you are as a Christian and who you are when, you know, when you're living your life every day at work and things like that. You should be, a, you know, acquiring... While your life goes on and you grow, you should be acquiring more and more the attributes and the virtues of what a true Christian 
is supposed to be. Amen. And we should not be just looking at, oh, well, most independent Bible Baptists don't do that. I don't care what they're doing. It doesn't matter to me. You know, I want to do what the Bible does. I want to be whatever you want to call it. I want to be just like Jesus, and I want to be just like the apostles, how they were. How I want to be how all the great men of the Old Testament were. I want to be all how all the great men who please God in his sight. Whether you want to call me a Baptist, whatever. That's what I want to be. I want to slowly just be trying to conform my life slowly, or really reform my life slowly, to that of Christ's life and that of Christ's character as, as I get older. Now, I want to I end here in Psalm chapter number 69, and we'll see further you know, David's character, David's great character, and uh, see how it reflects uh, that of what we saw taught in the New Testament and of Christ. And the attitude that he had of similarly being reviled but not reviling again. Being cursed, the blessing. People may read this passage and think that this applies really only to like uh, physical goods or something along those lines. But this can be also figurative. Look at Psalm chapter number 69. Look at verse number 1. We'll, we'll start verse number 1. Save me, O God. This is the Psalm of David, in case you're wondering. All the Psalms weren't written by David, by the way. Just in case you were under that impression. David did not write the entirety of the psalm. There are many psalms written by other people. Asaph, there are many people other than that pen the psalm. So this is a, a psalm of David. Psalm 69, verse number 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire. Where there is no standing, I am come into deep waters, where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. He's in serious distress. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being my, my enemies, wrongfully. Do you remember that? Talk about how we should you know, suffer reproach. And it should be you know, not if we've done something bad, but it's better if we're being buffeted for things wrongfully, like we don't deserve it. David does not deserve it. Lines up perfectly with that. He says, being my en enemies wrongfully are mighty. Then he says this, then I restored that which I took not away. That's a powerful statement right there. He says this, then I restored that which I took not away. What's he saying? They treated me bad. They did bad unto me. They cursed me. They reviled me. They, you know, were, they hated me. But do you know what I returned unto them? Not a revile. I didn't revile them back. I didn't curse them back. I gave back, what, you know, what really what they didn't deserve is what he's saying. I gave back that which I took not away. I didn't do anything bad to them. I didn't, I didn't owe them anything because they treated me bad is what he's saying. They didn't, they didn't deserve, if you will. If you stood back, step back and looked at the situation, when somebody say, hey, he should treat him good for what he did in the past. No, you would say, you know, he should go fight him or he should, you know, revenge himself. But that's not the Christian thing to do. You know what David says? David says, being my enemies wrongfully, these people are my enemies wrongfully. He said they're mighty. And then he says this, then I restore that which I took not away. He gave or treated them away in which they didn't deserve. You notice that? David is a perfect example of this. David, you know, is, outside of Paul of the New Testament, David is for sure. And maybe he is as great as Paul. Paul has his own strength, and David has his own strength. David is a great man of God. And do you know what was his strongest, his strongest, you know, characteristic that he had? It was discipline. He was an extremely disciplined person. You can see that, you know, he had his faults. Everybody, even, you know, human beings that you know that you would say, that's a disciplined guy. Of course, there are going to be times where they relax, right? You know, there are going to be times where they have problems, where they, you know, they fall into sin, where they're not disciplined enough. But Dave was a very disciplined person. And we can look at him as a great example. We can look at Christ as a great example. And the way in which we should live our lives is just slowly we should be coming unto that you know, that, that image of Christ. We should be trying to you know, build ourselves up under the stature of the new man, right? And one of the things that it's going to be, you know, it's, it's, it's much more difficult to attain unto are, is the teaching in Matthew chapter number 5. Is the teaching of when you're reviled to not revile back. 
When you're smoked even, to the point of being smoked, being hit by someone, being buffeted, personally, you know what you should do? You should turn to them the other cheek. This is a biblical teaching. You can see man in the Old Testament. David was being hit and injured. I don't know if you read that. I tried to emphasize it. But they were throwing stones at him and his men. You know, I'm sure he's not that bad at aim that nobody's getting hit. I mean, think about that. They're being cracked in the head. They're being cracked in the arm. This guy's picking up stones for the purpose of hurting them. And he's just winging stones at them. Just He's throwing stones at them. You know what David did? He suffered it. What did Stephen do? He suffered it. What did Jesus do? He suffered it. He's a great example. Obviously, you know, don't, don't misunderstand me. Defend yourself and defend your family if you're being, your life's being threatened, right? But if, you're, if you are in a situation where someone's just personally attacking you, don't retaliate. Turn to him the other cheek also. Look at Christ as our example. Look at Paul as our example. Look at David as a great example of, of, of doing this repeatedly in his life. It's a difficult thing, but it's attainable. We see other men in the Bible doing it, and it's, it's a... a, a a point of a Christian that we need to seek for that many people don't think is important anymore. You know why they don't think it's important it's not talked about? Because it's one of the more difficult virtues of the Christian life. Just turning the other cheek, allowing people just to treat you poorly. You know, in our human nature, we just always want to avenge ourselves. You know where that comes from? Pride. That's where that comes from. Because you think, I'm so great. You know, I can't let all these other people think bad about me. You know what you should do? Suffer it. Just allow it. Look through the great man in the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the great example. We thank you, dear God, for all the other great examples.